Hi, I'm Dr. Bill Bass, anthropologist at the University of Tennessee. We're going to take a look at some bludgeoning deaths. Uh, you can see that the whole right side of the skull has been caved in. Uh, and we can get an idea of what caused this by looking over on the left side. And you'll see here um, a very straight edge. And you see where the bone is indented here. But this is a metal tire iron, a, a, a device used to change the tires on cars and big trucks. So this is what's called a signature fracture. Uh, you look for these things to see if you can determine the type of instrument that was used. Now we're going to go to a second individual who uh, has been bludgeoned on both sides. This one is not quite as clear as the one that we just looked at, but you see uh, a bludgeoning blow to the right side of the skull. You see we have uh, restored uh, some of it there. Going around on the left side, though, you have a large area uh, and note the burn pattern here. This individual was not only killed, but an attempt was made to burn the body. In this burn pattern, uh, the external surface of the skull is burnt off, exposing the diploy. This would be the middle layer of the skull. And you can see where uh, we don't have this part of the bone because that was burned and fragmented. It's very difficult to burn a body. And in this case, the fire went out because there wasn't enough uh, fuel load there to keep the fire going. All right, we're going to go to a third individual here. We have talked a little bit about um, uh, signature fractures, and this is an individual uh, that uh, has been uh, bludgeoned on the left side of the skull. And you will note here a square pattern here. You see the very sharp edges. And this was done by something kind of interesting. This is a golf putter, and the individual uh, did not like his friend and he swung the golf putter and hit him in the side of the head and drives the bone in and leaves a nice little square uh, fracture pattern um, and you can figure out what type of instrument was used. Beware of who you play golf with. John Jefferson and I have two books, Flesh and Bone and Carbon Bone, that are both fictional uh, in both of these fictional books, uh, there is a considerable amount of, of uh, anthropology and a lot of forensic data. However, we are working on a nonfiction book at the moment in which one of the cases uh, we're doing a reconstruction of the skull to uh, determine who this individual was. And this is a good example of how you go about doing a reconstruction. Uh, what you do is you take the skull and we know from uh, anatomical measurements of many individuals, uh, what the depth of tissue is at various uh, locations on the skull. You can see there that uh, these down long in here are much longer, meaning that there's more uh, muscle there. This muscle will be replaced by uh, clay, and this is the first step that you do in a facial reconstruction. The next step is to connect each of these with clay and then to build it up and to sculpture the face I have identified skeletal material for law enforcement agencies for over a half a century and am really impressed at the changes that have occurred in forensic data, in the technology used to investigate crime scenes uh, and to solve crimes. John and I have uh, hoped that even in the fictional books uh, that we can teach uh, the audience something. Uh, the forensics in the, the fictional books is accurate. Uh, you can do a little bit more in a fictional book by uh, changing the scene a little bit, changing the characters. Um, in the scientific books, uh, the nonfiction ones, uh, we use the names of the good guys and the bad guys. They're case-based, uh, uh, but uh, this will give you a good idea of what uh, occurs in each of those uh, types of books.